All right, thank you very much. Um, also for the organizers for the kind invitation. And um, well, the disadvantage of giving a talk in late afternoon is that pretty much everything that has to be said about flavonoids has already been said. Uh, the advantage is that you already have gotten a nice introduction by everybody, so <laughs> there's not much more else to say. But uh, I will try to give you some novel information that you haven't heard so far. Uh, my title is Flavonoids, Phytochemicals, Phytonutrients, or Dietary Antioxidants. And I mention phytonutrients because a lot of people say that flavonoids are phytonutrients. So I want to start with a very simple definition of a nutrient, which is a chemical that an organism needs to live and grow, or a substance used in an organism's metabolism that is obtained from its environment. And you can already tell from this that um, flavonoids are not nutrients. Um, and then there are essential nutrients. Uh, essential nutrients must be obtained from uh, the diet because we cannot synthesize it or we produce it but in insufficient quantities. So examples of that are vitamins and nutritionally essential minerals. These are also called micronutrients and they're all essential nutrients. And then you have the essential fatty acids and amino acids and of course you have also non-essential fatty acids and amino acids and many other nutrients uh, that are essential uh, or non-essential. So a phytochemical is very simply a plant chemical. So any chemical in fruits and vegetables is a plant chemical, is a phytochemical. Whereas a phytonutrient is a nutrient in plant food. So emphasis here is obviously on nutrients. So here's a little test. See how you're doing in late afternoon here. Uh, which of the following is a phytochemical? Potassium, quercetin, vitamin B12, vitamin C, epicatechin, and fructose. Any guesses which of these are phytochemicals or which is not a phytochemical? Well, it's vitamin B12. Um, that's why vegetarians often have a problem with B12. It's only present in uh, non-plant foods. Uh, all the others are, of course, phytochemicals. They're uh, chemicals in fruits and vegetables. Now, the more tricky one is the phytonutrients. Uh, which of those are phytonutrients? And again, a lot of people would say, well, quercetin and epicatechin are flavonoids or phytonutrients. It's not true. Uh, the actual phytonutrients among these are potassium, vitamin C, and fructose. These are chemicals in plants that are nutrients. Hence, they are phytonutrients. So, all phytochemicals, uh, all phytonutrients are phytochemicals, but not all phytochemicals are phytonutrients. And please don't call a flavonoid a phytonutrient. It's not. It's just a phytochemical. It doesn't have a known function as a nutrient. It doesn't have a known function in biology. Uh, it is a xenobiotic, and flavonoids induce phase two enzyme metabolism, as we have heard before. So they are very differently metabolized uh, compared to vitamins, uh, which uh, are not phytochem and not uh, xenobiotics. Okay, in terms of dietary antioxidants, we already have heard a lot about this from Fulvia and some others. <clears throat> Early on, of course, people uh, looked at all these different molecules like quercetin and identified all different kinds of antioxidant moieties as hydroxyl radical, um, uh, hydro hydrogen donators. Uh, and this is the same for here for epicatechin gallate. You have the catechol group, the gallate group, and then the hydroxyl groups on the A-ring, which all could act as hydrogen donating uh, moieties and, and of course, uh, therefore, uh, make these molecules into antioxidants. But as we have also heard, uh, we have to consider a number of different uh, issues when deciding on whether or not an antioxidant is a good antioxidant. So the first one that is often considered in flavonoid research is the antioxidant capacity, which is basically the number of available electrons or hydrogen atoms per antioxidant molecule. And this can be easily measured by all kinds of um, antioxidant capacity assays, such as the ORAC, the TEC, and the FRAP, and so on. These are, again, very popular in the flavonoid field, but they only give you an idea of the number of electrons or hydrogen atoms that can be donated. They don't give you any qualitative information uh, about how strong or how uh, reactive your antioxidant is. To look at antioxidant strength, uh, you have to consider, as we have heard already from uh, Fulvio, the reduction potential, uh, very important, uh, because the free energy change must be negative. Uh, and then in terms of kinetics, obviously you have to overcome the activation energy. So we have a highly reactive or less reactive antioxidant, and there 
you're looking at the rate constant as the determining factor. So if you look at thermodynamics, uh, this is the famous pecking order published by Gary Buettner uh, many years ago. Uh, and I have inserted here uh, some of the catechins, epigallocatechin and epicalogatechin gallate, epicatechin gallate and here, epicatechin, and you can see that all of these uh, catechins are below uh, vitamin C, which is more reducing than any of these um, catechins, and the ascorbyl radical up here is even more reducing with a standard reduction potential of minus 180 millivolts. So uh, the conclusion of this paper was actually that vitamin C is the terminal water-soluble small molecule antioxidant in biological systems. Uh, the second consideration, again, is uh, the rate constants in terms of uh, kinetics. And here I'm just looking at the reaction of these different flavonoids with superoxide radicals, sorry. Uh, and again, looking at quercetin or epicatechin gallate or EGCG, uh, they all have reaction uh, rate constants of 1.7 to 5.4 times 10 to the fifth per molar and second, which is similar to vitamin C, which is 2.7 times 10 to the fifth. But of course, you have to uh, multiply these rate constants with the reaction, with the concentrations of your antioxidant molecules. And there, the flavonoids, again, have a huge disadvantage compared to something like vitamin C. Uh, intracellularly, vitamin C is present at 1 to 5 millimolar. Uh, you also have glutathione, of course, at 3 to 7 millimolar inside cells, but probably less than 1 micromolar of your typical um, catechin or flavonoid molecule, the epicatechin gallate here is an example. Similarly, in plasma, as we've already heard from uh, Billy Fraga, you have a lot of vitamin C, you have vitamin E, you have a lot of uric acid compared to very little of your flavonoids. So again, they're outcompeted uh, in terms of concentration and therefore uh, reaction uh, rate. And you can plug in the numbers uh, here for the reaction with superoxide radicals uh, in terms of intracellular fluids. Uh, again, each ECG as an example, assuming one micromolar inside cells the reaction rate constant gives you 0.35 times superoxide. For vitamin C, which is present at 2 millimolar, it's 540, so 1,500 times faster reacting with superoxide than your uh, flavonoid. The spontaneous dismutation of superoxide is very slow, but SOD catalyzed, assuming one micromolar SOD in cells, gives you a relative reaction rate of 1,600, about three times faster than uh, with vitamin C. So again, your, your flavonoid is hope, uh, hopelessly outcompeted and cannot contribute to free radical scavenging in a significant way. All right, one way to look at this um, was uh, done in this experiment many years ago by uh, Antonio Cherubini in my laboratory, where uh, he took human plasma and added increasing concentrations of black tea polyphenols and then exposed this plasma to AAPH, which is a radical generator. And what you see is a quite uh, significant inhibition of lipid peroxidation in a dose-dependent manner, going from 5 to 25 uh, to 50 micromolar uh, of your black tea polyphenols. Now, when you do the same experiment, but now you give uh, eight healthy subjects a half a liter of black tea to drink, and then you obtain blood before and one, two, three hours after uh, tea drinking, and then uh, expose the plasma to AAPH to see whether the resistance of your plasma to lipid peroxidation has increased, you see absolutely nothing. There's no effect whether you take the blood before one, two, or three hours after tea consumption, your rate of lipid peroxidation is exactly the same. Why? Because you're obviously not absorbing these black tea polyphenols in concentrations that make a significant difference. So what you achieved in this previous slide, five, 25 to 50 micromolar of these black tea polyphenols cannot be achieved in vivo. And you see no inhibition of lipid peroxidation. Now in contrast, if you do this experiment, but you use a true dietary antioxidant, namely vitamin C, you get a very different result. Here again, we had eight healthy subjects. They were first depleted of vitamin C and then repleted with increasing doses of vitamin C from 30 to 2,500 milligrams per day. And then at the end of each supplementation period, again, blood was obtained and plasma incubated with this free radical scavenger. 
what you then, then see is a very nice dose dependent inhibitory effect of these increasing doses of vitamin C going from zero up here uh, to 2,500 milligrams per day or almost completely inhibits lipid peroxidation ex vivo. Now similarly you can look at F2 isoprostanes which is an in vivo marker of lipid peroxidation and uh, feeding humans uh, uh, tea or high flavonoid diets uh, in a crossover uh, placebo uh, controlled fashion makes absolutely no difference in terms of your F2 isoprostane levels. I don't have to go into much detail here. It's very consistent that eating flavonoid rich diets does not result in a decrease in either urinary or plasma F2 isoprostane levels. Again, this is different with vitamin C, uh, especially in uh, subjects who have increased levels of F2 isoprostanes to begin with. Uh, you give them uh, vitamin C, two grams per day, uh, for uh, five days in heavy smokers together with uh, vitamin E. You can see that vitamin C alone as well as the E and C combination significantly reduces your urinary F2 isoprostane levels, hence has an overall antioxidant effect in your smokers. Uh, similarly, in the Linus Pauling Institute, Fred Stevens developed a new assay for measuring lipid peroxidation in vivo. These are metabolites of 4 hydroperoxy 2 non enel And if you look at these com combined uh, in smokers, uh, given placebo versus vitamin C, you see again a very significant reduction in these markers of lipid peroxidation in vivo. Very similar to what I showed you on the previous slide with F2 isoprostanes. Okay, so um, free radical scavenging is not an option for flavonoids in vivo because they react too slowly and they don't um, <coughs> Uh, accumulate in concentrations that could make a meaningful contribution to free radical scavenging. But as we have heard from uh, Fulvio, there is obviously this nucleophilic tone or this parahormesis idea that can activate KEEP1 uh, and this is the known mechanism that Fulvio already discussed as well as the phosphorylation of NERF2 with MAP kinase or PKC delta which then leads to upregulation of these phase 2 enzymes including gamma glutamylcysteine ligase, which is the rate-limiting enzyme in glutathione synthesis, which could, could then have an indirect antioxidant effect, as well as many other antioxidant and detoxification enzymes. Again, this is what xenobiotics do, right? They induce phase two enzyme metabolism. Uh, nutrients don't do that. All right, so we uh, looked at phase two enzyme induction in human aortic endothelial cells uh, using quercetin as an example of a flavonoid and what we found was that indeed heme oxygenase 1 as uh, well as NADPH quinone oxidoreductase and q one is induced. But interestingly enough, GCLC was not induced. And this is quite interesting because um, Roland Stalker and uh, Kevin Croft uh, published a very nice paper on the anti-atherogenic effects of flavonoids uh, using APOE knockout mice. And what they found was that uh, compared to the control animals, uh, this is aortic sinus lesion area. Quercetin had a very strong inhibitory effect, whereas epicatechin did not have an effect. This did not correlate with F2 isoprostane levels because in the control mice, there was a lot of F2 isoprostanes in the aorta. This was strongly reduced by quercetin together with the reduction in atherosclerosis, but uh, epicatechin actually further reduced the uh, F2 isoprostane levels, but had no effect on uh, aortic sinus lesion area. So again, most likely not an antioxidant mechanism, but uh, heme oxygenase 1 levels were strongly correlated with the extent of atherosclerosis. So APOE knockout mice, the control had low levels of heme oxygenase 1. Those were induced by quercetin, just as we had seen in our cell culture model. And then uh, again, no induction of heme oxygenase 1 by epicatechin and hence a high level of atherosclerosis. All right, uh, another potential effect uh, that could be indirect uh, and cause some antioxidant uh, overall effect is, uh, has already been discussed before as well, and this is Helmut C's idea of um, meth monomethylated flavanols uh, and other flavonoids as inhibitors of endothelium NADPH oxidase. And in this, uh, experiment here from Helmut C's paper, 
uh, the induced uh, endothelial cells with angiotendin 2, which induces uh, NOx activity. And you can see lots of reactive oxygen species being produced in these endothelial cells. If you pre-incubate your cells with epicatechin for 24 hours to give them enough time to form these methylated uh, derivatives, then you see very strong inhibition of angiotensin 2 induced uh, reactive oxygen species formation. So this could certainly be an interesting mechanism by which <coughs> you could preserve NO bioavailability because if you inhibit NOx uh, with these epicatechin metabolites, you end up with lower uh, superoxide levels and hence increased nitric oxide. Now, as we have heard from Billy Fraga, uh, indeed there is uh, good evidence from a number of human studies that flavonol-rich compounds, cocoa for example, can significantly improve fro-mediated dilation uh, together with uh, increased nitric oxide production, which in turn then correlates with the sum of your plasma uh, flavonols here in nanomolar concentration. And uh, they then also looked at the correlation with specific metabolites uh, and found that only epicatechin and epicatechin 7 glucuronide predicted the magnitude of flow-mediated dilation. And they finally focused in on epicatechin, which showed both this uh, dose-dependent as well as this time-dependent effect uh, on uh, flow-mediated dilation. Now, I have to point out that <clears throat> we did uh, similar experiments, but much earlier, this was in 2001, uh, when I was at BU, uh, Boston University, with John Keeney and Cho Vita, where we looked at uh, the effects of acute and chronic black tea consumption on endothelial dysfunction in patients with angiographically confirmed coronary artery disease. So we had 50 subjects, they took no antioxidant supplements, they had standard meds including aspirin and statins, and uh, flow-mediated uh, flow dilation was measured at baseline, and then two hours or four weeks after tea and water in a crossover design. And the water was colored and, and uh, tasted similar to tea, but did not have any uh, flavonoids in there, flavanols. And what we found was that, uh, not surprisingly, the placebo, acute or chronic water had no effect, about 5 to 6 percent flow-mediated dilation, which is very low and very typical of patients with coronary artery disease. So this is endothelial dysfunction. And if you give them acute tea, uh, just two hours after consumption of a couple of, uh, cup, cup of teas, of black tea, or if you give them chronic tea uh, for four weeks, you see a very nice significant improvement, uh, close to 10 percent now, not quite normal yet, but close to normal uh, both with acute and chronic T, and this is further improved uh, if you actually give acute on top of chronic T uh, to slightly higher than 10% uh, flow mediated dilation. Now, we looked also at the unadjusted correlates of baseline percent um, flow mediated dilation to figure out which components in T uh, might actually have this beneficial effect on vasodilation. Uh, we looked at all kinds of independent variables from blood pressure to uh, pro, uh, excuse me, lipoproteins, uh, BMI, C-reactive protein, and th the various catechins, as well as markers of oxidative stress, and none of these correlated with vasodilation. The only two that did was log baseline flavonoid intake at a p-level of 0.02, and interestingly enough, uh, log epicatechin, uh, which was highly significant. And this also then you know, pointed the way to epicatechin as the active ingredient in black tea, similar to what Billy Fraga showed us uh, for uh, cocoa. And this was published also uh, quite early in 2005. So here you have that nice correlation between epicatechin uh, from black tea versus flow-mediated dilation. Now similarly, um, plated aggregation, we've already heard about that, is also inhibited by nitric oxide. Uh, this was a human study looking at uh, purple grape juice versus uh, grapefruit or orange juice co uh, consumption. Purple grape juice, of course, high in your um, flavon 3 alls in contrast to grapefruit and orange juice. And you see that after one week of juice consumption with the purple grape juice, you see a very nice inhibition of platelet aggregation, which you do not see with grapefruit juice or orange juice. And if you incubate these platelets with purple grape juice, 
you can actually see that they themselves produce nitric oxide in a dose-dependent manner and hence platelet aggregation is inhibited. Now how do our polyphenols, black tea polyphenols, improve ENOS or nitric oxide synthesis? Well, one mechanism, as I mentioned, is possibly by uh, preventing superoxide production and enhancing the bioavailability of nitric oxide. The other one, I think, is uh, probably even more straightforward, which is a direct phosphorylation and hence activation of endothelial nitric oxide synthase. That's shown here uh, with black tea or black tea polyphenols. You see increased ENOS activity, which is strongly inhibited by the ENOS inhibitor L name. And if you look at serine 1177, you see a very nice time-dependent phosphorylation. Uh, threonine 495 is dephosphorylated uh, by uh, black tea polyphenols. And to make a long story short, what John Keeney showed uh, was that black tea poly polyphenols via P38 MAP kinase phosphorylate estrogen receptor alpha, which is a ligand independent non-genomic mechanism. Uh, the estrogen receptor alpha then activates PI3 kinase which phosphorylates AKT, which is the known mechanism of serine 1177 phosphorylation and threonine dephosphorylation, which increases ENOS activity. Uh, PAKT could also explain the anti-inflammatory effect because it inhibits NF-kappa B activation. To conclude then, flavonoids are not phytonutrients. Uh, there is no evidence that flavonoids act as raw scavengers or have antioxidant effects ex vivo or in vivo which is in contrast to vitamin C, which is a good, strong dietary antioxidant. Uh, flavonoids activate the NERF2 ARE pathway. They are xenobiotics, induce phase two enzymes, including hemoxygenase one, which may play a key role in the anti-atherosclerotic eff effects of certain flavonoids, for example, quercetin. And furthermore, uh, black tea polyphenols directly activate ENOS via estrogen receptor alpha and PI3 kinase AKT mediated serine 1177 phosphorylation. And then finally, and most importantly, in humans, black tea, purple grape juice, and cocoa, rich in flavon 3 oils, in particular epicatechin, increase enos activity and enosynthesis, and hence improve vasodilation, inhibit platelet aggregation, and reduce, reduce inflammation, which together could uh, explain why there's a lower coronary risk uh, in humans consuming these kinds of beverages and uh, foods. And with that, I'd like to finish. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Well, in this experiment that I showed you, we did deplete them first of vitamin C, which was the study by Marco Levine at NIH. And then he had this stepwise increase in daily consumption of vitamin C from 30 to 60 to 100 to, and so on, all the way up to 2,500. You don't have to deplete people of vitamin C to see the effect, uh, unless they're already saturated. If they have an intake of 200 to 500 milligrams a day, you saturate plasma, and then you can give them as much vitamin C as you want. Your plasma levels won't go up any further. But if they are below the saturating concentration of about 80 micromolar, any supplementation that brings them up to that level will also increase the antioxidant protection of plasma against lipid peroxidation. Uh, just a curiosity. In, in that experiment uh, with the different um, juices, yeah. orange, and do you know if they have a different content of nitrite? I don't know. No, that could be another possibility of how you improve NO production. Yeah, yeah because as you know, a nitrite can be reduced to nitric oxide. So. Yeah. Okay. Right. That's a good suggestion. I understand your concern about the use of the term nutrient. Yeah. Um, some years ago, some people I think I was involved with suggested the term secondary nutrient. 
Okay. What do you think about the use of that term? Well, I'm not exactly sure what the definition of secondary nutrient is, but a nutrient is a nutrient, right? It has a known biological function. It either provides calories, the macronutrients, or it has an essential role in enzyme function or acts as a hormone uh, like vitamin D. Uh, and it's either a micronutrient or a macronutrient, and flavonoids are neither macronutrients nor micronutrients. So. But if we have a class of substances that, it, that extends lifespan, for instance, by reducing cardiovascular disease, then could you apply the term nutrient to something that has a health benefit? I, I don't think so. Uh, the classical definition of nutrient, as I mentioned, is it has to play a role in normal growth and function uh, and metabolism, <clears throat> not so much disease prevention. I think much of the benefit from flavonoids comes from the fact that they do induce phase two enzyme metabolism and they activate NERF2. So this hormesis, uh, I think, idea is very much what I think happens. So if you're have a carcinogen coming along, uh, you're already primed to detoxify that carcinogen and have your cancer protective effect that way. So chronic disease prevention, I don't think counts as uh, a nutrient. Doesn't mean that flavonoids do not have health benefits. It just means they work through different mechanisms. I have another point. Okay. Actually, what are your answer? Because the basic question about all this mechanism about the vasodilation is that do these guys activate and all or is it uh, super cell Right, yeah. <laughs> like there is no answer so better. <laughs> and another one about uh, the green tea. Mm -hmm. It's amazing because in the green tea, the major difference between green, green tea and black tea is that you allow the leaves to undergo oxidation. Right, exactly. It means that in the black tea, you have a much more oxidized compound. Well, from what they presented before, yeah. the mechanism comes from the oxidized species. Do we have any evidence supporting my dream right now that black tea will be better because you don't need to oxidize the polyphenol because they have already oxidized the tea? Yeah. Uh, that's a possibility, uh, but green tea actually shows very similar effects and maybe even better effects. Uh, I mean, the Japanese drink mainly green tea, and then with white tea, which is the least processed type of tea, uh, because the study was funded by Unilever. <laughs> uh, but it's an interesting idea, yeah. The problem is you wouldn't absorb a lot of these DF flavins and the high... At least there is room for black tea, which is not popular in Western countries. Yeah, yeah. It does have the benefits in terms of NO production, vasodilation, there's no doubt about that, yeah.